What's up, friendly neighborhood nerds? If you want to hear interviews from industry pros, get first looks, and have access to endless comic content, wake up. Please wake up. You're in a coma. Your mother misses you. What's up, friendly neighborhood nerds? This is Judah Rad, and I'm here with Respawn. Today we have a very, very special guest. He's a television director who has worked in worked on Cops, not to be confused with the other Cops, uh, <laughs> Stripperella, the animated Gen 13 movie, and Batman the Animated Series, as well as other, other shows. He's also directed a music video for Pearl Jam's Do the Evolution, and today he's on our show. Welcome, Kevin Altieri. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, like I said, Judah's super excited. We love the show, and I think a lot of people, like, I don't think I've met a comic fan that doesn't like Batman the Animated Series. It's such a piece of art. <laughs> oh. um, by the time by the time you started working on it, you were already a veteran of, like, the superhero action <laughs> cartoon genre because you worked on Rambo um, and you directed Cops. Well, we'll talk about Rambo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. No, I, no it was, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> what was it like uh, finding out that you were going to be bringing characters like Two-Face um, to life? Um, it was pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I bet. I mean, you, I mean, you kind of pointed out, if you look at like the career, it was like you st I started out at uh, doing uh, television animation um, at Deke and it's kind of indicative of that whole era of the 80s where you couldn't do this you couldn't do that you couldn't you know you could kind of stretch things like with Starcom we got kind of close to actual action adventure and cops another one you know where we actually had you know because one of the characters was called bulletproof we could actually use bullets you know it was right. kind of necessary but even at that, no punches to the face, you know, all the rules, no breaking glass, all, all the things you had to dance around. And um, no, no breaking glass. That was a thing. Yeah. Oh, you couldn't have glass breaking. You couldn't Why? point a weapon at camera. Everything right. had to be three quarters or, you know. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, there were children could not be in danger in any way. Even in like real Ghostbusters, where you would have kids in the cast, it's like they could be scared, but you couldn't have actual jeopardy of any sort. Ah, that is, sounds so difficult. That's that's interesting. Um, so I remember noticing like on the GI, like on GI Joe, like you'd see like a plane explode, but they'd always show the parachute. Just absolutely ridiculous, and um, <laughs> they go into combat and they're just spraying bolts of power or whatever laser guns. <laughs> and it's just absolutely ridiculous that no one's being hit and I mean it's not combat. Maybe that's maybe that's why the stormtroopers can't hit anything because they just watch too many 80s action cartoons. That's well, what it is. Yeah, no, they're they're just bad shots. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Stormtrooper Academy, that's the problem, yeah, I think. Stormtroopers are just bad shots. <laughs> that's so, all I can figure out. I mean, they couldn't hit droids running across a hallway, so yeah. Right. <laughs> no, but but anyway, but then when uh, Batman, I was working on, um, I was doing comics at the time, but the previous animation job I had was I was on um, Lion King in development wow. over mm. Disney and Treasure Planet. Oh, uh, I love that movie. So, <laughs> thank you. <It's> so good. <laughs> right, yeah, I, I was, I was had a hand in the design of the uh, pirates, the pirate crew. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, no, that that was a fun part of that. Cool. But in, but I was uh, doing comics uh, over for TSR when I heard that they were doing uh, Batman over at Warner Brothers, and I said, "Oh, you mean the guys did Tiny Toons? Yeah, that's gonna you know that's gonna work out because all of the <laughs> Saturday morning rules, all the BS and P rules, were still in place. Wow. Um, and if you look at Batman, uh, that first, especially the first season. Part of the reason I think they chose uh, the first script I read was Man Bat. And I went, wait a second. There's a werewolf transma transformation in the script. He's a monster. We can go a little bit further with this. It's like, because every time if anyone would complain about Jeopardy, we'd, uh, you know, we'd say, well, he's a big monster. You know, it's a monster. Well, what's Batman going to do? You know, and the great thing about Batman is the way he fights. If you'll notice, we kind of mm, change the way that he he's he's a martial artist. 
So he throws. When he punches, it's with, uh, like, you'll notice, like, he'll use an open hand blow. Ah, okay. A le legitimate blow. Um, things like that. You could dance around the fact that he's fighting. And also the thing is, Batman is not lethal. He mm -hmm. will not kill. Under any circumstances, Batman will not kill. So he had the grappling gun, and he reaches under his cape, you know, and pulls out whatever, you know, gas balls, things like that. So, you know, he didn't, he's not, never going to try and kill someone. But we were able to get BSNP to allow guns because what's bat what's the point if batman isn't fighting against criminals with weapons mm. and they said oh it better not be something a kid can get his hands on so we said how about a gangster tommy gun from the 30s okay <laughs> you know okay. <laughs> sounds like they were flexible <laughs> yeah i know they, they they were it was also mainly because uh gene mccurdy and um tom ruger and warner brothers were very they, they really were backing up the creative end of things mm -hmm. so you know that that's how that's how that all happened wow and it was it, it was great i mean at first i thought you know oh yeah that we're gonna do a they're gonna try and do another goofy batman you know um but then after i interviewed with bruce and he showed me, and I had never seen it, he showed me that little trailer that they did, a four-minute teaser. Maybe it's three minutes. But anyway, that teaser that everyone's seen, and the opening of the show is kind of based on. Um, once I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, I got it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, nice. Yeah. Awesome. The uh, episodes that you directed um, stand out as being very character-focused like uh, POV, Two Face, and Feet of Clay. Like, you're kind of you. You, you uh, it seems like you were the guy they went to for like more of the origin story slash individual not character study type stuff. Um, did you did you know you that you were working on something so special and groundbreaking at the time when you were creating these episodes? No, I did not. Dan, <laughs> Dan Reba, if you talk to him, it's like. Dan makes fun of me and Bruce, you know, like, cause, cause they would sit there and, you know, and I'm, they, they were convinced they knew this was going to, this was like a fan thing, you know, Mike Gogan, everyone knew. I think I was just nose to the grindstone too much that I was just, well, when I went up to the WonderCon in Oakland that year, when, um, before it went on the air, um, I just would go up to the WonderCon every year. It was like the best the best convention you know and it was a lot of fun just the right size and i i would just fly up there it was like a quick trip you know from my house and uh when i went up there one year it's like denny o'neill was there who i kind of knew a little bit from uh, dc comics legend <laughs> huh <laughs> yeah and denny o'neill yeah no he's the man Mm -hmm. And he um, goes, says, hey, Kevin, we got your cartoon here. We're going to show it today. I'm like, what? You're showing the cartoon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we love it. We love it. You, it's like, man, you did a great job. No, no. You got to cut. You're going to You got to come by. You got to see it. OK. So I go to the pub across the street for lunch, you know, and I have like, you know, two or three beers because I'm up at Comic-Con. And then I'm like, oh, you know, I walk over across the street and I hear the music starting to play and I'm like, Oh, they're showing the cartoon. And I kind of expected it to be like, you know, you know, convention, you know, it's like, there's a TV set and a bunch of kids sitting around it, you know? And I go in and I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. Packed. It was, yeah. like the, it was packed to the rafters and, and, um, the audience reaction I mean, I, I won't say it really surprised me, but it was really gratifying. Mm. Um, I, I really thought, you know, I, I thought it was good. But uh, the audience reaction was really overwhelming. Um, and then, of course, Denny calls me up on stage after they show it. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know anything. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I wow. turned beet red, you know. <laughs> what a cool experience, though. That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, speaking of legends, you've also written um, with, or worked with, like, I should say, um, writers like Paul Dini and Marv Wolfman. 
yeah, what what was that like? Are they collaborative? Is it mostly them like dictating the story? Like, how does that go? Um, well, Marv was um, Marv was like one of the guys that would come in from the outside. You know, would deliver scripts. Him, Len Wein, those those guys. Okay. Uh, Paul was in house, and okay. uh, I knew Paul because we have mutual friends. You know, before from before Batman. Um, but Paul would actually come into my office a lot and just, you know, I had pet rats at the time and he'd come in and he'd feed the rats, you know, and stuff. And then he'd just sit there. <laughs> Sometimes he'd come in, like one day he comes in and says, you know, Kevin, remember Cesar Romero? Yeah. He played the Joker, right? You know, he always had a girl in the gang, didn't he? It's like, yeah, he always had a mall, didn't he? He says, yeah. Yeah. I think the Joker needs a girlfriend i think he needs a mall and then he'd leave and the next thing you know it's like the script would come in <laughs> or he'd come in, or he'd come in and say okay harley uh gets out of arkham she's released out of arkham and uh, veronica reeland is taking bruce wayne out shopping <laughs> you know things like that <laughs> you know and then shenanigans happen and Cool. You know, and then Veronica Vreeland ends up, you know, being kidnapped by Harley. And I go, yeah. And George Patton is her dad. She's an army brat. It's like, yeah. Yeah. So you bounce That's off each of... other really well. That's really yeah. fun. No, no, it was really, it was really a good collaborative process, you know. And, uh, and you know, Paul's he's such a good writer. He's such yeah. a good writer. Yep. It's, you know, I actually had to snag a couple of his scripts out of Dan Reba's hands. They were going to give it to Dan and give me, like, someone else's script and said no give me that no. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a compliment i love that so, what, one of the uh, most famous well i think it's one of the most famous episodes but um you know i i've watched through this entire show probably more times than most 33 year olds would admit um but uh <laughs> hey. one of my one of my faves <laughs> say, say it again the club it's like you know just like look at me it's like it doesn't matter I'm, I'm still an eight-year-old in my head I still Amen. watch Johnny Quest. Oh <laughs> yeah. Sorry. One of the one of the best episodes, in my opinion, is the Clock King. Um, and oh. I think you did a, you did a really good job with that character conveying what a prickly like nut job <laughs> he, he was. <laughs> um, is it more or less? Would you say is it? It's more or less challenging to convey a sense of com character development when directing animated work versus directing live action work. Um, well, when you're doing live action, um, it's a different it's a different kind of thing working with the uh, actors. Because um, when you're doing live action, you know the actors face uh, their emotion, even if they're in makeup. You know, even if it's uh, mocap or whatever they're kind of defining a lot more whereas in animation um the voice comes first you know mm -hmm. here's do the voice and andrea romano always picks the best you know unbelievable choices of actors you know Ooh, play you ain't kidding. yeah i mean clock king's a good example it's like that guy that voice was just great and it's like just that nasal weird you know, anal guy who's yeah. actually deadly, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, but, but yeah, it's animation. That's kind of part of the reason why um, I kind of stuck with animation instead of going. I mean, I did I did go back and do I used to do special effects in the 80s and, uh, you know, live action storyboarding and design. And I would go back and do things for guys like Dave Allen, you know, um, special effects jobs here and there but i reason why i stuck with animation is that as a director especially um you really do control the performance and the acting it's like you really are doing it mm. it's uh it's, it's a different thing you know and and yeah you, it's you the nuances and stuff that you get and it's funny you pick the clock king because that is one of the cartoons that annoys me tremendously. Because really? I, I look at the animation, and I am not happy. <laughs> really? Like, yeah, I huh. like, 
why doesn't TMS have this one? You know, mm. <laughs> it's like interesting. But it's like, yeah. but it's, but you know, I mean, people to, and and I knew Sunrise was going to get it, and I knew they were not going to be up to snuff on the animation. So you kind of geared, I geared the storyboard and the layout and the design towards artists who are going to have trouble drawing this stuff, you know, and animators that are going to have trouble with it. So you kind of, as a director, you kind of gear it towards the studio. I like, see. For, for instance, uh, Feet of Clay. I mean, they gave me this script just because it was just, I mean, you know, this, this is the second part of this is like when he manifests, I'm like, man, this script is asking for a lot. It scared scared me when I was a kid, by the way. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's like, and that one went out, and, you know, Bruce and Eric agreed, and, and uh, Alan Burnett, and they sent, they made sure they cleared the plate, and they made sure that one went to TMS, you know, because TMS is the only hope it had of really, uh, and and it came the animation came back so good you know um like i said it before i can only recall three retakes on that first pass animation wow. that tms sent us and it came in a week early wow yeah and that one i was just like oh thank you you know yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> but yeah no but the clock king i mean it's I, I i it's a real super strong script too you know that that script is just so much fun you know nice. yeah anyway yeah. cool so <laughs> so you kind of brought this up a little bit earlier but i kind of want to delve more deeply into it so the way you describe the conception of the harley quinn idea um comparing that to just the explosive commercial success of that character now yeah um uh, and you and you came up with the uh, origin in Harley Quinnade, or you uh, directed the origin in Harley Quinnade. So, and that sort of carried over to DC Comics canon. So, yeah. I guess my question is just how how cool is that? <laughs> it's pretty cool. All and right. I was I was uh, that was the one I actually yanked out of Dan's hand. I'm so, it's sorry that that you know Paul came in you know and. Uh, he actually, you know, as I said before, you know, he actually came into my office like a month earlier and said, hey, you know what? You know, I think the the Joker has an atom bomb and Batman doesn't know where to find him and he has to spring Harley from jail. You know, and it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And the Joker is like, got, has a helicopter and says, no, no, it's a biplane. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. So, so Paul leaves, you know. And flash forward a couple of weeks, and I hear it because uh, Bruce's office is right next to mine. And I hear Paul and Bruce in there, and Dan, and they're talking about a show. And as I'm listening, I hear them talking about a helicopter, and I go, "Wait a second. <laughs> My episode. <laughs> and I had not, other than Mask of the Phantasm. I mean, I did the last lap, and I got to work with Tim Curry as the Joker. Um, you know, and then he Incredible. got it. And that was the last laugh was the only Joker show I had, um, up to that time. I got to do the Joker stuff in Mask of the Phantasm, but I did not get to do a Harley Quinn after the, you know, it's like everyone else is doing it. And then I just walked in and I said, sorry, Dan, but I'm getting the Harley show this time. Yes. <laughs> awesome. And Dan couldn't like, well, you know, he couldn't argue. It's like, yeah. and, and, and then fly in the wall. I'd love to see that. That'd be great. Is, is Arlene <laughs> fun to work with? Oh my God. That it's, um, one of the joys of the job, um, that I'm very sorry that none of you guys get to see is to get to see Arlene Sorkin and Mark Hamill doing <sighs> Joker and Harley face to face playing. Oh my God. I, I would pay it. Serious money to be able to see that. <laughs> I I don't even think it was ever recorded, but it was uh -huh. like because they Mark when he performs he turns into the character. He he should have been the Joker in the Tim Burton movie. Yeah, he, he really should have been. 
He's yeah. the jokeriest joker that's ever jokered. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Although, Tim Curry did a damn good job. I was going to ask, what is he like? Because I'm a huge Tim Curry fan. Well, he um, his joker was more based on, it was more gravel. Mm. And there, and he played him a more as a schizophrenic kind of personality. Like there's two different, like he would shift from attitude. Like normal to crazy. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cool. He's like, well, Captain, you know, <laughs> like he said, he'd jump into different personalities, you know. Oh wow. And he'd go, but his laugh was was more varied. Like he didn't like uh, the the Joker laugh that Mark has is the Joker laugh. Yeah. Um, 100%. Know. Yeah. Whereas Maybe Tim I can Curry... convince Judah to do his Joker impression. His, oh, <laughs> his Mark Hamill Joker impression. You should do it. Just do, yeah. do one line. I feel like a boy who just found his Christmas presents. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean... Tim Curry would like I loved I loved the laughs because he'd go ha 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 ha, ha. Yeah. and other times he'd go he'd crack himself up and he'd just go <laughs> you know <laughs> like you okay. killed Captain Clown yeah <laughs> was that you Tim? killed Captain Clown it's like you know <laughs> just for that Batman what do you think of Margot Robbie as Holly do you like her as oh yeah no I mean she's fine. I think she's a good actress. Um, I am not a fan of like the the Suicide Squad. Um, I'm a I'm a rather Harley purist, although I do admit that I like <laughs> I, I like the Harley Quinn cartoon. That's oh, a, oh. it's funny. It's good. Yeah, it's it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot from your uh, show yeah. too. Uh, I was very surprised. Um, I mean, I have friends that um, that I've worked with, and that you know, like Jennifer Coyle, she's a friend of mine, and you know, Cecilia Aronovich, and all you know, and Brandon McKenney, and all those guys. I know all of them, you know. So I was like, eh. but yeah. when I watched it, uh, I was really surprised that it was done as a direct sequel. To Batman the Animated Series. Yeah. Yes. Can't explain where the baseball bat comes in. Mm. They explain things and, and they make it a joke and they make it funny. Yeah. Uh, so, you no, know, they, they had me. And it's like, and um, I feel like it's the one cartoon that, um, that Warner Brothers is doing that currently that almost benefits from the um, flat animation that they're doing nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, things have changed. You know, it's like it's hard to get, like, that really great animation. Um, but it's almost like if the animation was, like, TMS level, mm. you wouldn't be able to watch it. Because <laughs> it would just be a hideous bloodbath. <laughs> it was right now, just fun. Yeah, so, that's pretty rad. Yeah, I want to go back to Denny O'Neill, if you don't mind, just a little bit, um, because some of the Batman episodes that you directed are adaptations of um, his issues of the yeah. comics. Did you ever reach out to him for inputs when you were planning those episodes? Um, oh. How did those? Yeah. No, no, there's no question. It's like I yeah. mean, when I was 13, and I first read the uh, Neil Adams Denny O'Neill Racial Ghoul, you know that oh, the series arc. of comics, yeah, mm -hmm. Talia. And going all the way through, cool. um, you know, to to the kiss in the desert and Batman stripped to the waist and the, the sword fight. Um, that was the one, the first time in my mind, even as a thirteen-year-old, I was like, I want, I'm going to do this as a cartoon. I've got to do this as a cartoon. It's my dream. Wow. And when I first showed up at um, Warner Brothers and I interviewed with Bruce and I interviewed with Eric and I interviewed with Bruce and I said okay and one of the caveats that Bruce said that he couldn't stand that everyone always does and all the comics would always do is here's Bruce Wayne head poking out of the Batman suit with his cowl off and he said we're never going to do that and I said until Rachel <laughs> sees him in the Batcave yeah, that's when it happens. And I said, and I'm doing Rachel Cool. 
just yes. promise me I'm doing race all goal. And mm. Bruce was like, you got it, man. And uh, Helen Burnett came on board. You know, he wasn't the original story editor. And it's like I went through the same thing with him. He says, just promise me, Alan, I get to do Rachel Ghoul. So, you know, that was and that's also the that was also the first time that we didn't do a title card. Oh, OK. It's a it's a it was a definitely intended as a break from the usual dark deco Gotham thing. You know, this is I like, love I love those title cards, by the way. Oh, they're, they're awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, Eric and Rudomsky was in charge of that. You know, I, I, I'm not sure who drew them all the time, but I think it was mostly Eric, you know, just coming up with the concepts and stuff for him. Yeah, sweet. Um, but, well, anyway, to answer your... And then Denny O'Neill, Paul, I, I think, was it Paul? I don't know who, I don't know who it was. It could have been Marty Pasco or... Um, I'm not sure. I think maybe it was Marty who was the story editor. But in any case, Paul or whoever reached out and said, hey, Denny, would you like to write a script of uh, Rachel Ghoul? So Denny actually did his own adaptation. And I got that script and I was like, yes, this is awesome. You know, and I read, and I really thought he did a succinct and really smart adaptation. And then it got story edited and changed and switched around. Mm. And I went, I know people aren't going to like me for this, but I'm going to go with the the first draft. I'm sorry, but it's too long. You know, we got it's like, we'll hand, I'll handle it. I don't care. Make, it's make it work. It's Denny O'Neill. I want it untouched, you know, and and that's what we work from. Amazing. Basically, well, awesome. draft script. That that is a. Uh, I did honestly didn't anticipate that story. I'm curious now because I'm. We both want to know what it was like working on Musk of the Phantasm. Do you have any <laughs> <laughs> cool stories from that project? Um, Such a good movie. Yeah. No. It. I mean. Again. I. I. I won't say I lucked out because I kind of opened my big mouth that I said up until that point, I said, look, I haven't worked with Mark Hamill. Come on, give me the Joker. And Bruce and Eric and Alan Burnett, they said, you got him. So when you watch Mask of the Phantasm, it's like all of the Joker stuff is me and my crew. It's me and I think Mark Wallace and... uh, Mike Gogan, Mo Mike Gogan did the Hart Bachner in the hospital sequence, you know, wow. and in the in the the counselor's office. It was like brilliant, brilliant storyboarding. Um, but and you know, and Brad Rader too, he was on my crew. And the shackles were off because uh, it was it was no longer on TV, so all the rules out what? the window, right? Uh, yes and no. Because the you should have seen the first cut. Uh, there was more blood. Really, a lot more. Oh yeah, those there was two two shots of those auto auto gyros going at Batman that I drew, that they took out. You know, and they're saying, "Oh, it's for time." And they said, "No, it isn't. You guys got cold feet." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like oh, wow. the gyros. Because if you look at it, and I shouldn't say this, but if you look at it. There is a shot where he's being attacked by, um, I think it's four originally. And then he takes out a couple of them. And then you'll notice that in the last one, there's two that come around. They're going to attack. There was another two coming around on the other side that were going to get him in a crossfire, right? You know, slash at him. Um, And then you'll see a cut. And all of a sudden, here comes three. And his cape grabs him and he smashes him. So there hmm. are two or three other shots in there where he's getting sliced. And then his arm gets hit and it just blood just sprayed out. And then when he after he chases the Joker upstairs and the Joker's putting on the jetpack, um, before he gets out, you know, he steps outdoors and he's looking for the Joker. And there's a shot where you where you kind of pan up from his belt up to his head. That was originally camera holds on his feet, and there's like drip, 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 drip. It's like 
So you, they you, still you, they still showed some of the blood on the Joker's face. No, they, they did. They did, and it's like they, I got to knock his teeth out. Yeah. But, was, but what was taken out was like he has the Chrysler building. He actually at one point stabbed Batman through the shoulder with a spike. <laughs> that would have been so, cool. Does, does that he, animation still exist somewhere that we can find? <laughs> Release the extended <laughs> cut. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> It, the I, the spike to the shoulder didn't make it through the storyboard um, because I had him, he stands up and he's like really injured. And that's why when he kicks the Joker, the Joker gets a, a moment because he's got to yank this spike out of his shoulder, yeah. you know, so and that, that allows the Joker some room to, you know, get a, you know, to summon the uh, auto gyros. There's this weird part that I love. <laughs> And it's where they're in Joker's fun house in Mask of the Phantasm. And there's all the automated, like, there's the automated wife yeah. who's, like, He's dropping. Like... He goes up to her and he, like, pinches her cheek and rips off, like, a piece. And then he puts it in his pocket. Yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, that's the board. That was, I think, Brad Raider. I think he came up with that. That always makes me laugh. That's so although, funny. Although the baloney, uh, the baloney joke is mine. You know? Oh. Where it's, like, oh, reaching... There's a knife, you know, a cleaver, and a baloney. <laughs> and it's like, he actually picks the baloney. <laughs> he goes for the baloney, that's right. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I'm like... Um, so, shifting gears a little bit, um, I I could sit here we, we I could sit here and talk to you about um, Batman all day, uh, but just, we got other people watching, and who knows, maybe they're into, I don't know. But, um... I really, really, really liked Stripperella, by the way. I thought it was really awesome. I fucking um, love Stripperella. It is so... <laughs> it is way better than it deserves to be. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. No, then, then the budget was, like, really heavily curtailed on that it one. Looks so, it looks so good. It's good animation. And yeah. uh, you yeah. got to work with Pamela Anderson and Kid Rock. What was that like? Oh, um, Pam was... Um, this. Well, it was right after... I mean, I remember I had the conversation with her... And the weird thing about that wasn't weird, but um, Pamela Anderson without her uh, makeup, and I think she at that point she had a breast reduction, so she was kind of back to where she was like on tool time size, mm -hmm. you know? and uh, she didn't wear platform shoes and stuff. You know, she kind of was like you know this nice, really petite, sweet girl, um, and. Uh, it was uh, really easy to work with her, you know? Nice. Um, yeah, no, it's like, she, she was like, she was actually really fun. Mm. And, uh, and you know, and of course, everything had to go through her, design-wise and stuff. Um, there arose, like, you know, competition between her and Stan Lee, though, later on. At first, I mean, when they hired me out of nowhere... <laughs> It's like I got the phone call and it was like you know, actually arranged, um, and I you know came in there and I had an interview with Stan Lee and with the people over at Nickelodeon. Um, I'm like, you're gonna do here this at Nickelodeon? I mean, have you been reading the? I mean, really? <laughs> oh, I mean, no this, way. This is like late night stuff, and they're like, yeah, no, they really wanted to do it, and. Um, they gave me the schedule and the schedule was really, really tight. Like this, it got a very late pickup. So it was that kind of worked to my advantage because they needed character designs very quickly. And they needed, um, like you see the logo Stripperella. That's my hand drawn rough. Hmm. They cool. just took it and ran with it, and it's like printed it as, as the logo. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I still look at it, and I mean, that's kind of wonky. That S is kind of wonky, but whatever. Hey. God, you know, but it, and that they uh, that was done very, very quickly, and um, that kind of actually worked to the advantage. Like the opening credits was kind of something I had to storyboard very quickly and just come up with to convince people about the style. Mm -hmm. um, and I had worked with Brad, Cro Brad Coombs on a Pearl Jam video. And he was an excellent, excellent uh, character designer. And I got Troy Adamitis, who I worked with on Batman, you know, to be uh, the only other director on the show. 
and <laughs> God, you know, it's like, and the budget for that was supposed to be, I was originally talking to them and they were, they were saying, well, it's four hundred thousand dollars And I'm like, geez, that's not enough money with, you know, it's like, it's a secret agent superhero cartoon. Are you kidding that's me? So little, yeah. yeah. And then it just kept getting less and less money. Mm. <laughs> and so, it was like, I think the final budget, including music. And I had uh, a Mott's Plessner to do the music. Um, and he, uh, actually did it for the price and did a tremendous job, wow. a tremendous job. Is and, that why there were only 13 episodes? Cause the budget just dwindled away or? Uh, no, the, uh, I was gone after six episodes, even though we had storyboarded three more episodes. Um, but, um, Stan Lee wanted to, you know, he, the magazine started printing articles saying, you know, Stan Lee, animator. And I'm like, really? You're an animator now? Okay. I, I know what Jack Kirby was talking about. Wow. <laughs> so at that point, it was like, I was, I was pretty much, after the first season, um, it's not me. That's mm -hmm. when you see the character design change, that's not me. <laughs> I, had, okay. I had nothing to do with that bizarre thing where suddenly you can see your eyeballs. Uh, ah, okay. That was yeah. uh, after I was there, and I had nothing to do with it, and I don't know what Stan was telling everyone, and I, you know, it was a whole different crew, whole different. Wow. Yep. Uh, Interesting. And the, the makes uh, sense. And the next seven didn't really last long. I think it was it aired for two episodes, and then they canceled it. Yep. Um, whereas like the first season, it was a tremendous success. Mm. And uh, it, it, it's, and again. Working with that episode where we had Kid Rock, man, the crew. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the people I had worked on Batman too, mm. um, but that you know the storyboards and um, the design, and we were like working like clockwork. And by the time we got to that episode with the, with uh, Kid Rock and the island with the giant crabs, it's like we were. It was like the jokes were just. We were cracking ourselves up. <laughs> so like, you know, I mean, Mike Diedrich would do storyboards. <laughs> and there was one, you remember the one with Chipperella? Yes. Chipperella. Oh, th there was the storyboard that came in and I just like picked up the storyboard, you know, you know, I have to, I have to look at the storyboards. I have to see what everyone's doing and I'm going through and I'm checking, I'm checking. And I go up to the page where strip where Chipperella's on stage and he just goes and, whips off his shirt and throws it, and then all these panties just fly into his head. <laughs> and I just started cracking up. <laughs> um, that sounds like, like such a... That's my day-to-day -day life. Oh. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> For Rich Chidlaw would do, like, a joke, like he'd have, like, the chief. I always gave the chief. I usually gave that to, <laughs> to Rich Chidlaw. But it's like there's the one where Stripperella, he says, here, is he's got, like, that big crotch protector. You know, he says, here, I got to test out the crotch protector. Of course, he doesn't put it on. And so they says, go ahead, hit me as hard as you can. And she just <laughs> this sledgehammer and just. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this is the funniest drawing I ever saw. It was awesome. Amazing. I wish I drew it. Anyhow. I, I'm going to shift gears slightly. I want to ask you about Gen 13. It sucks that Disney didn't release Gen 13 in the U.S., was it an emotional blow to you to see something that you put so much work into get somewhat buried? Oh, well, of course. Of course. Yeah. It's like, you know, um, but again, it wasn't, I mean, yeah, it was, it was good. Special. It was oh, really good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, and what you're seeing, um, when Disney made the deal with Jim Lee, um, Basically, the budgets, uh, you know, I couldn't get any more retakes. So what you're seeing is not very far from a work print. Wow. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a bit better than a work print, but it's, uh, it, there, there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of retakes that I really wish I could have gotten. But yep. um, at that point, you know, you couldn't. But I'll say this, um, the experience is like, I had an office a block from the beach where I surfed. Fuck yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> and that was, you know, for a couple of years, I was like downtown Santa Monica, you know, um, not even downtown, down in the old downtown Santa Monica. Oh. 
Oh, nice. That time was kind of a ghost town. It's um, bougie now. It's a very bougie area. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, back then, it was like, you know, back then, Venice was, you know, much rougher and stuff. But, um, mm. and uh, I was right across the street from ZJ Borden House. You know, ah. <laughs> like, you know, the surf shop I always went to, and uh, and I just had my boards in the office, and I could go out, so I cannot complain too much. Um, and I think it came out all right, and mm -hmm. it did get international release. I mean, it's everywhere That's... in the world except the United States. Right. Everywhere. Like I was getting like uh, the Directors Guild will send you, you know, they're not big checks, but you'll get checks when they're. And once in a while, I'll still get a check on Gen 13. I said, where's this from? Netherlands. It's like, oh, my God. You know? Fuck yeah. It was, it, awesome. was on, it was on Dutch TV, I think. It was like, you know, for a few years there, it was like a perennial on, you know, like they would show it like two or three times a year on television. It's a hidden gem. It is definitely a hidden gem. Yeah, um, so this next line of this next line of questioning, I'm looking for honesty, and they're somewhat controversial questions. So looking for you to answer before you spend okay looking, looking looking for you to answer before you spend too much time thinking about it um what is your favorite episode of batman that is really difficult <laughs> yeah just a hard question go <laughs> it is. no because in many ways it's like i gotta say what's my favorite one well god you know i think maybe it's got to be harley's holiday you know Ooh. you know that's no, 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 it's Showdown. Because okay. I had a hand in the script, and I got to do Jonah Hex. And I got to do, you know, the Wild Wild West. Uh, like, I got to do the Ironclad Zeppelin, which I had got to co-design with. That's a tri trippy episode. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's like, I can't believe that we did Showdown. It's, it's just, uh, it's hard to believe. And it's also the only ball punch you got to see on Saturday morning. What? Yeah. I didn't know that. Nice. <laughs> yeah. It's like when, the, when the, um, the minions are going in to steal or kidnap um, Arcady Duval at the beginning at the old folks' home. And uh, you'll notice that there's a shot. Um, who drew that? I think it was Troy Adamitis who drew it. But we, <laughs> it's like Troy's a martial artist. I've taken martial arts. So we, we'd we kind of be simpatico on like staging, um, staging fights. And uh, there's that one shot where the guy, you know, takes a, he's going to take a shot. And he's going to, he's got a, a knife and he's going to stab Robin. Then you cut to Robin and you go down from the guy you see his legs and you go down and there's robin and robin hauls off and just fires one <laughs> and then you just cut to the guy's head like oh and he goes wow down. oh what a fun trivia i had no idea that was uh, the first one that's gonna be my winning jeopardy question one day yeah <laughs> and it, it is a ball punch hey <laughs> so and and uh, robin i mean i talked i actually said this to lauren lester is that you, you know the thing about Robin is he's a real dirty fighter. And it's like, they see Robin, it's like Batman, you know, he can do things like there, there's things he'll do like at Foley's Fish Market, you know, where Batman will just go up to a guy and go, hmm, and the guy will turn around and run and hit himself. Yes, I love that. <laughs> Whereas Robin pulls out the nunchuck fish and beats the snot out of those guys, you know, and you get away with it because it's fish. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like it's not nunchucks, it's fish. He's just smacking you work the guy in such a fish. weird environment. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine, it's fish. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, but um, that's, that's, that's how you get around certain things. That's it. It's so creative. I love it. Um, it's similar. I've got a similar question to Judas. I want to know which Batman comic arc or run is your favorite. Um, Rachel Ghoul, mm. the uh, Neil Adam. Mm. Neil That's Adam, right. Neil O'Neill. It's That's like where I, the dream started. I, yeah, yeah, I, I mean that was my Batman. Did you read anything as a grown-up that you enjoyed Batman-wise that you'd recommend to people watching? As a grown-up? Yeah. When did that happen? I know. That's what I feel <laughs> like. <laughs> 
Uh, Do you have a Sonic collection at home? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's there? Oh yeah, nice! Oh like, uh, yeah. For my house, you know? Amazing. Yes, uh, I've had, I've collected comics since I was a kid. Um, I managed to hang on to them. When my mom tried to get them, throw them out, it was like, no! <laughs> um, I've just been going through my garage and pulling out boxes that I haven't looked into for years, you know, and yeah, no, I, I collect comics. I'm a huge comic fan, obviously, you know, it's awesome. difficult because these days, lots of people, like I have a lot of mine on the tablet just for, because when you move house, it sucks. <laughs> you it's know? Just, just not the same. It's not, just the, same. not the same. No, it's not. It's like, there's something about newsprint and, uh, tactile media yeah shiny shiny covers and yeah, yeah. And the way that the ink would soak up into that that kind of newsprint they had in the 70s you know in the 60s mm -hmm. 70s, um there's just a look to that four color printing process that no one can get and and they they've reprint a lot of comics on white sheets for like trades now um and that coloring from it doesn't look it only looks good on newsprint yeah, no, it it does. It just isn't good. So when you get reprints, it's like, hmm, this too, is disappointing. Yeah, and yeah. It, and when they do, especially when they do computer color, it really doesn't work. Like I don't know if you're, I'm a big fan of like Richard Corbin's, and I don't know if you remember. Or, I mean, it was probably before your time, but when Warren magazines, which were black and white, did those color uh, inserts by Richard Corbin. Richard Corbin would make his own color plates. Wow. And they were rich and vibrant. And it was still, it was like that, but it was like that color on the newsprint mm -hmm. that just, it just sang. It's beautiful. Agreed. And then, um, yeah. So, and it, not as far as to answer your question about new Batman comics, um, I haven't been reading them very much. I mean, I'll pick up a book and I'll go, hmm, this seems really mean. I mean, the last, I mean, I loved Brian Boland's take. I loved The Killing Joke. I thought that oh, yeah. was awesome. You know, Brian Boland, uh, I loved, uh, well, again, it's like I'm going back in time, you know, so that that's about, those are my Batmans. It's like when, when you start changing the outfit, when Batman doesn't have the shorts, you know, and you can look at his junk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I am just not on board. I mean, a lot of a really great artists have done Batman, but um, hashtag you know, no Batman junk. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like you don't go into combat if, like, if anyone has ever taken martial arts, um, protect your groin, <laughs> pants. You know, <laughs> yeah. Pants. Captain America, he, he didn't have to be convinced to put those shorts on, uh, even though he's got chain mail and stuff. No, no, Captain America, he puts, you know, he's he keeps it covered because mm -hmm. you, you know, you it's do. a major, it's, it's a, a major target. vulnerability. Yeah, it's a yeah. target. <laughs> so. so, what's your uh, not counting Batman the animated series or any of those uh, Bruce Tim or Paul Dini related uh, Batman series? Uh, what is your favorite screen adaptation of Batman? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, that's a hard one. Because it's like I'm, again, I have troubles with it. It's like the Tim Burton, the one thing that I'll say about Tim Burton is I think that um, Michael Keaton is a good Bruce Wayne, not such a good Batman but mm. it's such a Tim Burton movie, you know, that it's a Tim Burton movie, so you love it. And mm. yeah, and, and um, the sec the sequel with um, you know that, that Catwoman is just you know Michelle Pfeiffer is Catwoman. That's awesome. She was great. Yeah, yeah. No, that that was that was awesome. So I'll have complaints about the movie about my take on Batman, but I think that those are just like the Tim Burton. He makes Tim Burton movies. Mm -hmm. they're, and they're just really goofy and fun. Yeah. There's always a Tim Burton vibe yeah. to to it. And then you know, and I'm a I'm a big Joker stickler, but it's like Heath Ledger's Joker was. I mean, where did that come from? You know, I mean, it's like that that is such a weird interpretation 
but you can't argue with it. It's so so chilling. And it's cool. I liked I liked it a lot. Um, it's a completely different Joker. You know, what I mean, um, I just I go. There's nothing to compare it to. No, it's like there's nothing. And then I go and I say, why is he called the Joker? I don't know. You know, <laughs> it's like I don't know why he's called the Joker. I mean, he could be called any number of guys. But anyway, that I mean, that's all. It's all really good stuff. I guess it's, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, no, that was and, awesome. and I still have <laughs> I still have a soft spot for uh, the Adam West movie. Mm-hmm. With Cesar, Cesar Romero. Oh yeah, you know it's like that one. It's such a hoot. His, his white mustache. <laughs> yeah, and I saw that in the theaters, you know. And I was just watching. Um, even now, I remember back one of the things that really got me. Uh, that that one it was like they had the climax on the uh, the submarine, and uh, I'm watching it, and I like you know I'm a cat person. I always have cats, you know. And you see uh, the Catwoman and that. It wasn't Julie Newmar, unfortunately. That really bothered me. It wasn't Julie Newmar. But that cat, you could see that they were talking. You could see the cat freaking out. Because here's these guys with this makeup on and these yeah. weird hats and stuff. And, I could, and I'm sitting there, that is a good Catwoman because that cat must be clawing the hell out of it. Yeah. Got to the fight on, at the end. You see Batman he takes the cat throws the cat and then they'll show you a couple of shots of the cat sitting in in uh, a dinghy you know a little yeah. rubber boat <laughs> it's a, just gotta make sure the cat's okay that's right <laughs> <laughs> man people are always so pissed off about the uh, animal deaths aren't they it's so funny and then you, you look at all the human car- carnage that's left behind you're like all right uh, <laughs> exactly that's it uh we've only got a few questions left i wanted to know what you've been working on lately Oh my God! <laughs> I've been, I um since the COVID nineteen thing happened, um, but I, I have been working out of the house. Um, and the, the last thing that I did was Onyx Equinox, uh, which was for Crunchyroll. Um, ah, okay. It's the, it was the Crunchyroll. It was um, actually it's created by uh, Sophia Alexander. Uh, takes place in Mesoamerica ancient the ancient world which i really loved um and it's 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 uh, the bloodiest thing i've ever done really i'm so dante's inferno so i'm intrigued yeah but it's <laughs> coming out on crunchyroll you can you can catch the trailers right now but it's a that that one was like the last uh, studio project i worked on and um lately i've been i've been signed on to do this uh well i've written I can't talk about it right now. I wrote my screenplay with my partner, Bill. Um, I can't talk about it right now, <laughs> but you guys it's will coming. love it. It's, it's a horror action adventure feature, um, and it's 2D animation, and uh, we're talking to people about you know financing and all that. And I I've been, can't wait. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I've done development for it, and wait just a second, I'll... I'll, I'll see if I got like development that um, doesn't give too much away. <laughs> this is exciting. Have you considered crowdfunding? Um, a lot of people are doing that now. I I don't know how that stuff works. Um, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> oh wow! Whoa. Oh, wow! Just That's cool. I like that. development. Okay. I'm so I'm... excited. <laughs> That's just one. It's like there's other images that are more indicative of what the project is. Um, that's coming up. Uh, Yay! And, and I've been signed on as a producer and director of uh, Killer Bowl, which is uh, to be a science fiction feature that takes place in the future, written by Gary Wolf, who created uh, Roger Rabbit. Oh my god, amazing. Wow. Great guy, by the way. I just talked to him the other day. Um, you know, and we're we're just hammering out how it's you know the show is gonna be done. Um, but that's set to be a two D feature length feature film, um, science fiction adventure, but it takes place, it's like the game of Killer Bowl is it's like a game like we're you know, it's kind of like a combat version of a Amer- cross between rugby, American football, and uh, UFC martial arts, and it's like it's you know it's, a, it's an action adventure that's going to 
<laughs> no, it's an action adventure in the future. You know, yeah. and, um, really kind of a Blade Runner, um, Running Man kind of world. Nice. So Co this is a Coco question. She's the one asking right now. Um, she wanted to know, what have you been nerding out on lately during COVID since we've all had so much time kind of at home? Oh. Uh, mm, nerding out on, I mean, my God, comics. I've been just reading comics from the 70s, you know, pulling them out of the boxes and stuff. I've reread, but I'm also a big, a big nut on um, historic fiction. And I've actually reread all of the Flashman books by George McDonald Frazier. Huh. Back, went back to Flashman, the first one, and read them all in sequence, in actual historic sequence, which is, you know, which was a lot of fun. Interesting. It sounds like you've been having a good time reading you. Good enough. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I really wish that I could surf more, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's like I'm not braving the crowds, you know? I've got to. Oh, yeah. I've got a mom who's in her 80s, and it's like, and I don't want to... Uh, Stay safe. Yeah, I don't want to risk any of that stuff, you know. Yeah, that's so, mm -hmm. yeah. Final question for you. Is there anything you'd like us to make note of for our audience before you go? Any last last words that you got? Last words? Yeah. What are your last words? <laughs> not, not, <laughs> just for today, not for your life right now. <laughs> just this interview. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I'm just really glad that people just, like, enjoyed what I've done you know it's like it's what Jack Kirby you know Alex Toth Jack Kirby Richard Corbin Mike Plug I mean Will Eisner it's like you name Neil Adams Archie Goodwin it's like what would I where would I be without those guys you know without you know where would I be without Doug Wildey doing the cartoon you know doing Johnny Quest or, or John or um, Alex Toth you know doing all the Saturday morning I'm sure a lot of people where feel would, the same way about you Yep, oh, that's thanks. true. That's absolutely true. Yep. Where would where would I be without Iwo Takamoto? You know, do, designing all the Hanna Barbera cartoons. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of the same thing, and I'm still still doing it. You know, yeah. um, I mean it's it, it's great. It's gratifying. You know, and I'm glad that people really like the stuff. Fuck yeah, we really enjoyed absolutely having do. you on the show today. Like we are over the moon. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, my um, Anytime you want to come back, we'd love to have you. If you have any future projects you'd like to come talk to us about, maybe when stuff yeah. gets released, you can come talk to us about it. Yeah. No, no. Nice. It's like, and it's like, you know, Killer Bowl's coming up. Um, I, you know, it's like I'm just starting development on that right now. Great. And uh, so you'll, uh, everyone will, everyone will dig it. All right. Awesome. Well, cool. guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, wear a mask, destroy the patriarchy, and take care of yourselves. And be free. Follow our links and watch our show because you want to and not because of the threats. Thank you for watching Judah, Robo, and Ree. We talk about comics, movies, and TV. Sometimes we have notable guests and sometimes it's just us but we're also cool